All right, guys, so let's get into existentialism, existentialism, absurdism, and nihilism, okay? It's going to help us out with uh, Albert Camus' Stranger, which uh, some of you have finished reading by now, all right? So let's go through existentialism first. And what we'll do is we'll touch upon uh, absurdism and nihilism. Nihilism, not so much. Okay? It's rather simplistic and doesn't really apply to what we're trying to discuss here in The Stranger. But existentialism is key. There's something that Camus is saying with regards to existentialism. Remember, he was friends with Satra. Satra was an existentialist. Okay, uh, We need to discuss what it was that Camus was doing with regards to that. So, first of all, existentialism opposes any absolutes. Remember, existence precedes essence. Okay. Thus, naturalisms, I perceive, therefore I am, is rejected as accepting the binding control of nature's laws. Okay, so we've discussed that a little bit before, okay? We need to understand that. Existentialism opposes any absolutes. The categorization of several things has no essence to the existentialist. The existentialist starts with experience first. He exists because he exists, he thinks, he feels, he perceives. That's it. That's the way to define themselves, if they even define themselves in the first place. There is nothing but what there is, okay? Our feeling, our state, our existence is one of dread and anxiety. Again, we've discussed that before when we were looking at Borges. Borges discussed that time is a man-made creation, right? The sundial, the clock up on the wall, the clock on our phone, that is man-made. The existentialist sits there and says, I don't really adhere to these things if I don't feel like it, okay? So what we have is anxiety and dread created because of these man-made creations like time. We sit there again, we've discussed this many times before. You get up in the morning and you go, I'm on time, baby. This is awesome. I'm gonna get to school. I'm gonna do what I need to get done, turn in my assignments, I'm golden. It's gonna be an easy day. Or you wake up and boom, you, you've woken up late. You can't go to 7-Eleven. You can't get your Slurpee or Yoo-Hoo, sorry, whatever. And all of a sudden you have this anxiety. You have this dread. You've created that because of this man-made construction that is time. The existentialist rejects those things because they don't want to live with anxiety or dread. When the existentialist is no longer conscious of himself as being, he feels that he is nothing, okay? That's what we saw with Rousseau. Rousseau, in part two of The Stranger, essentially just passes time, right? We see he sleeps 16, 18 hours a day in his prison cell, and then what's the rest of the time? He talks about how he eats, he goes to the bathroom, and he reads the same story over and over and over again, okay? That when they lose conscious of themselves, they're nothing. So that's what we see with that. Because each man knows that he is free and that he is the origin of his own having, possessing, creating, and existing, he is in anguish, pain, and dread. The existentialist is free, no matter where they are. We don't know that type of freedom. When we think of freedom, we think about the construct that is, we're Americans, we're free, the rest of the world not so much. They can't say what they want to say. We have freedom of speech, freedom of religion. And then we debate those things, and we sit there and say, what is freedom attached to the Bill of Rights? What is freedom attached to our Constitution, the amendments? The existentialist is not bound by those concepts of freedom. They simply choose and face whatever repercussions exist. They sit there and say, I can go A or B. Whichever one I'm more willing to choose the repercussions of, that's what I do. Okay? That is what the existentialist looks at. But each man is isolated alone with his own freedom, as we discussed. Okay. Whoops. Okay. No other person or agency except time can take this burden, this freedom from him. And like I just said, Merceau, when he's in jail, he chooses to sleep 16 to 18 hours a day. He goes out, he walks in the yard when he gets a chance. There you go. He gets used to things. That's what the existentialist does. They get used to it. They choose 
the path where there's no anxiety or dread. So what's bad about being an existentialist, you might ask. That is what Camus is discussing. And when we get to the very last page of the book, um, that's what we're going to discuss in class. Why is it that the ex being an existentialist is bad? Why is it that altruism, as Ayn Rand, we're going to be reading later on this year, why is altruism bad? Man should never fool himself of any hope of future success. We saw that with Merceau. Merceau said, uh, with the prospect of getting married to Marie, seems like a nice gal, right? She's devoted, she's loyal to him. He says, I, I don't think I love you, okay? He also goes into the idea, uh, the promotion that he received from his, his boss. He said, hey, I'm gonna promote you, you get to go to Paris. And he goes, nah. We sit there and think that that's mind-boggling, but again, man should never fool himself with any hope of future success. He sits there and recognizes that he's content where he's at. There's no need for that promotion. There's no need to get that success. That's only man fooling himself. Thus, human existence is replete with lack of fulfillment, emptiness, and frustration. The existentialist lives without those things. That's really, again, something hard for us to even contemplate sometimes. How can we live an existence without frustration and emptiness? That's what we all try to do every single day. Like, how do I get through without being frustrated, sitting in school, being bored, or being frustrated with my parents, or this was just a pointless day? But then here's the other part of this equation, lack of fulfillment. How do you get through with a lack of fulfillment as well? You're not trying to crave contentment or joy. How, how does that happen, right? The existentialist is able to do that. Existence. I exist. It is what it is. The existentialist believes that belief is consciousness of choosing. We've said that many times before. They choose the path that they feel like they can handle. That's it. That's it. Choice is always possible, but what is not possible is not to choose. They don't try to conquer things that are inconquerable. It doesn't make sense to the existentialist. Why would they try to break down barriers? Why would Merceau try to uh, tackle the racism that we see within the novel as well? He kills an Arab. The Arab is never named. Not once. Not once. Obviously, there's racism attached to that. Camus is pointing that out. However, Merceau doesn't care. Obviously, society and the justice system that Merceau exists within, they don't care about the racism either, nor trying to conquer that problem. The existentialist, again, is not trying to break down those barriers, not trying to destroy racism. Camus is pointing it out. I want you to consider why that is. Next slide. Still two more slides with existentialism. It is the focus of this particular unit, after all. When he fulfills himself, he exists. This fulfilling can come only through the agony of choices which uphold his own self-consciousness. Wasn't well, that interesting? It seems to be contradictory to what we talked about in life without fulfillment. Well, when he fulfills himself, he exists. Kind of like when you do something that you want to do. You eat chocolate. Mm, Rousseau did that. He sits there and is a creeper looking at the people walking by on his, uh, uh, you know, below him on his balcony that one day, right? That's what he wants to do. He's fulfilling what it is that he wants to do. Remember we talked about the id, the ego and the superego. I want you to consider that psychoanalysis of Merceau. He is an existentialist, but he still has an id, ego, and superego. Consider how they work within the novel, okay? Fulfillment, relative. Consider that. Are you fulfilled with menial tasks? You organize your binder and you feel good. You wash the dishes, you feel good. You don't know why you did it, you don't know why you feel good, but you feel good. You walk across the street, you might feel good. That's fulfillment. Hopefully that makes sense, if not, ask, okay? The conviction of making choices is never one of reason, only one of intense passion. Human existence is no more than passion. Mm. Consider that, everything we do well, sorry, I don't want to generalize like that, but Camus would argue that passion is what we exist for. That's what we're trained to do. If we're passionate about something, we're told, go for it. 
okay? Uh, that's what human existence is. What is existence without being human, though, is what, you know, we're really taking a look at. Rousseau doesn't seem human in the book sometimes. He seems callous, calculating, cold. So what is it like to exist without trying to be human, humane, altruistic, have a kind bone in your body? Consider, what counts as real is the individual's inner response to a situation which he has experienced. Again, something we've discussed before in this class is the existentialists might consider it folly to sit there and say that we have the same feelings. We've gone through the same experiences, quote unquote, before. We've lost a similar type of mentor. We've lost a certain type of person in our life. Therefore, we must feel the same. The existentialists would argue that that would be absurd if they were to even argue anything in the first place. That's absurd. We don't feel the same thing. We don't taste the same thing. The existentialist says it's folly to even categorize these things at all. We've talked about this before. C.S. Lewis said we read to know we're not alone. The existentialists would argue against that too if they argued. Why? We don't share those same experiences or feelings at all. We have our own unique experience. That's what the existentialist would say. Last slide with existentialism. Man is absurd. We're going to get into absurdism in just a minute, which is Camus' forte. He could escape his agony by suicide, alcoholism, protracted narcotic states, and other abnormal acts against human existence, but he avoids these. He prefers to live within, sorry, with his consciousness, certain only of uncertainty. He learns to accept and to live with the fact of death. He equates his constant negation as a death or a reduction to nothingness. There's a lot there. That's loaded. Okay? Existentialists could do these things. And we see Rousseau certainly, you know, he engages in smoking cigarettes. He likes those. He has to give that up when he gets to prison. Right? But isn't it interesting later on in part two when he's offered the cigarette by the police officer shortly before he goes on trial and he says no. He got used to these things. He got used to the fact that nothing is left. That everything that exists with this trial is absurd. He understands that. He understands that nothing is left. He's going to face the repercussions of killing the unnamed Arab. It is what it is. He could give in to committing suicide within a jail. After all, he's been in there for 11 months before his trial even starts. He could have given in to alcoholism to just distort reality. But why? If you resort to just existing and understand that death is a part of this existence, the existentialist would argue that's all there is. That's all there is. Don't try to distort reality. There's no point to it. Accept what there is. Finally, because of what I am as an existentialist, I cannot stop time except through death, suicide, insanity, alcoholism, or narcotics addiction. Talk about, uh, you know, really making it basic, making existence basic. But that's, again, what Merceau does within the jail. Remember, we talked about time. How did he look at time? Just passing. We don't want to pass time. At least that's what Camus argues. The mo most of us sit there and go, I don't want to pass time. We want to pass time in school. We look at the clock and we go, 3.48, please. We sit here today, uh, this is the day we were all hoping to stay at home from school because of snow. That never happened. Thank you, Mr. Weatherman. Uh, we sat there and said, I really wish that school hadn't taken place because I could have enjoyed the day. I could have enjoyed my time. Rousseau just tries to pass the time. Consider that. Consider that. We don't want to pass time. The existentialist is just not waiting for death but accepts that death is eminent, and that's it. Okay, let's move into absurdism. Sorry, guys. Oh, what am I doing? There we go. Now, we didn't study the myth of Sisyphus. We didn't have enough time. Uh, what's interesting is that we can actually see Sisyphus when we get to Dante's Inferno. He's in the fourth circle of hell, okay? He's with the hoarders and the wasters. And we're going to take a look at Sisyphus 
when we get to Dante's Inferno. Uh, the absurd is born out of this confrontation between the human need and the unreasonable silence of the world. All through The Stranger, we should have noted several absurdist ideas, okay? We, of course, have the man who abuses his dog and then is completely distraught without the dog. And all he did was just try to break the spirit of this poor animal. Wouldn't let the dog urinate. In the middle of the dog urinating, he yanks on the, the rope and just moves on with the dog. And when the dog doesn't want to move because it's still going to the restroom, he kicks the dog. He abuses the dog. And yet when the dog runs away, he is depressed. That's absurd. It is an absurd idea. Raymond is a pimp. He beats the Arab girl up big time. And we should sit there and go, this is deplorable. Uh, these deplorable actions, should, someone should put a stop to them. But no one does, right? Nobody. So absurdism exists all over the place. We question things all the time. And that's what Camus is pointing out, this, these absurdist ideas. The absurdists want us to see life as a kind of absurd comedy, a surrealist, surrealistic painting with, the, with familiar elements in unfamiliar places. Okay, so again, we recognize the absurd on a regular basis. We question things, we go, why is this like this? This doesn't make any sense. And Camus says, what are you gonna do? Life is a comedy. It's a comedy of errors, okay? Why am I doing that? Well, this is entertaining, isn't it? All right. Is the idea that humanity must live in a world that is and will forever be hostile or indifferent towards them. The universe will never truly care for humanity the way we seem to want it to. That's pretty obvious, right? We sit there and uh, think, what can I do to change the world? Some of us are feudalists with regards to that. Like, I want to change the world, but what can I do? And we sit there and every once in a while we cater to the idea that I just got to make my own path within this world because there's no changing it. There's no changing. Everything is absurd. Can't change politics, can't change school, can't change teachers, can't change laws. So I'm just gonna make through. The atheist view of this statement is that people create stories or gods which in their minds transcend reality to fill this void and attempt to satisfy their need. Again, you don't have to agree with this statement, but this is what the atheists uh, believe, especially the uh, athe atheistic existentialists. They sit there and say that people create this higher power that is God. And basically, they want to believe that there's some meaning to their existence, that God has a plan for them. And atheists sit there and say that these people are completely absurd. Okay, That there is... Um, Another idea would be that you are meant to do something. You know deep down inside, you wake up and you go, I was meant to do this. I was supposed to do this. And people, and not just atheists, but we're talking about absurdists here, excuse me, absurdists would say, you're just trying to fill that void. You have no idea what fulfillment is. You're just trying to fill a void. It's absurd. Can you prove that you're meant to do this? And people can say after the fact, yes, but before that, the absurdists would say, prove it. Okay? Okay. Now, this is really clever. If we look at through the looking glass, right? Some of you have seen this before. This is awesome. Okay? This is the quintessential absurdist idea. The Red Queen began again. Can you, an can you answer useful questions, she said. How is bread made? I know that, Alice cried eagerly. You take some flour. Where do you pick the flour? The White Queen asked. In a garden or in the hedges? Well, it isn't picked at all, Alice explained. It's ground. How many acres of ground, said the, said the White Queen. You mustn't leave out so many things. Okay, that is the absurdist idea right there. Uh, we didn't read Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. Okay, uh, we talked about it briefly while looking at Hamlet. It is about the Tweedledee and Tweedledum characters of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. It's an excellent 
three act play. There's a really good movie attached to it as I've talked to you guys about it before. Tim Roth and Gary Oldman play uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. It's quite excellent. And it basically goes into this type of wordplay, which is the quintessential piece of absurdist literature. The absurdist part within The Stranger we've discussed before with those characters, okay? Marie stays with Merceau, even though he doesn't love her or doesn't think he loves her. Why does she stay with Merceau? We, we see that type of person, um, arguably, sorry for generalizing again, we may see this type of person every day at school. Someone fawning on someone else, unrequited love, right? Uh, we might see that on a television show and we just sit there and go, why is this person fawning over that person? It's just ridiculous. And it is. That's what Camus is saying. Marie keeps going after Merceau. We don't know why. That's why we're going to take a look at feminism within this book, okay? In addition to looking at Marxism as well. So let's take a look at nihilism real quick. And we're going to keep this one brief because I've, I really want to focus the majority of the time as I have on existentialism and absurdism. Nihilism is the belief that all values are baseless and that nothing can be known or communicated. It is often associated with extreme pessimism and a radical skepticism that condemns existence. If the world didn't exist, I'd be happy. I didn't ask for existence, so I don't owe anything to anyone. A true nihilist would believe in nothing, have no loyalties and no purpose other than perhaps an impulse to destroy. We talked about that before. I'd be happy if the government just was eradicated, okay? They really like the movie Olympus is Fall. They like the idea of those symbols and those statutes falling. They like the end of the world type stuff. Why? Because it eradicates this structure that is completely absurd within our society. Why is it that we follow the Constitution? Again, they don't question things, they'd just rather have it blown up, okay? There's no questioning with existentialism, absurdism, and nihilism, which makes it frustrating. They don't question things. They just know what they want. Nihilists want everything gone. They don't want a structure. They say structure is ridiculous. Ex existentialists also say structure is rid ridiculous, but they choose to move through. Absurdists point out the fact that everything is absurd. Okay? Those are the main differences. But just in case we're confused, I have two charts that we can take a look at real quick. This first one, and this is a little bit small, two graphics. My apologies for making this so small. But there are five real tenets here, okay? And this is from Wikipedia, which is ironic, but there you go. Now, we talked about the fact that there's atheistic existentialism, theistic existentialism, which you're like, how in the world can existentialists believe in God? But it is true. There were. Absurdists and nihilists. Number one, there is such a thing as meaning or value to be found in life. The atheistic existentialist says, yes, I exist, therefore I am. The theistic existentialist agrees with that because God put them there. There is meaning. The absurdist says, absolutely. The nihilist says, no. There is inherent meaning in the universe, either intrinsic or from God. No. The atheistic existentialist says, absolutely not. There is no inherent meaning in anything. We just discussed that. The theistic existentialist, maybe, but humans have faith, have, must have faith to believe there is. Faith in ex existentialists. I know some of you are going, I don't understand that. But again, these are the ones that believe in God. If you have a faith that there is a higher power, then obviously there can be the possibility of meaning in the overall universe, okay? Absurdists, maybe, but humans can never know it. Those are agnostics, yeah? Okay, pretty much. Denialists, never. Absolutely not. They, they don't believe in any structure, guys. Three, individuals can create meaning in life themselves. Yes, it is essential that they do. Absolutely. Yes, it is essential that they do. The existentialists believe in that. The absurdists go, yeah, but it's not essential because everything is absurd. These things are absurd. So how is it that everyone can create meaning in life themselves? Some people just do things just because they do. It's weird. No, because there is no such meaning to create. It seems like it's really nice to be a nihilist. They just don't care about anything, right? 
Four, the pursuit for intrinsic or extrinsic meaning in the universe is a futile gesture. Yes, and the pursuit itself is meaningless. There is nothing to it. No, and the pursuit itself may have meaning. If you believe in God, there is meaning. Yes, but the pursuit itself may have meaning. That's what the absurdist says. Okay? Why is that? Because the pursuit itself for intrinsic or extrinsic meaning, okay, is a pointless gesture. Remember, the absurdists point out everything that's ridiculous. Everything. Okay? And they recognize things as being ridiculous. You watching this lecture, some would argue, is ridiculous. Why? There's no grade attached to it. You're only using it for intrinsic or extrinsic meaning in the universe or within yourself. Denialist says, absolutely, the pursuit itself is meaningless. Absolutely. Five, the pursuit for constructive meaning is a futile gesture. No, it's not for the atheistic existentialist. The goal of existentialism is this, very tenant. No, thus the goal of existentialism, same thing with theistic existentialism. Remember, the pursuit for constructive meaning is futile. Structure. Maybe. We'll never know. Okay? We might know in death, but you can't come back. Okay? Well, what about ghosts? It does not touch that. The nihilists, absolutely. It, absolutely. Everything's futile. Okay? Let's look at one more thing. I like this, okay? Uh, again, we, we simply have just our different philosophers, okay, up here. We have Camus. This is Camus right here. This is taken shortly before his death, okay? But these different philosophers, and we can get into them a little bit later, the atheist existentialist, is there such a thing as meaning in life? Yes. Is there inherent meaning in the universe? No. Can we create real meaning ourselves? Yes, and it is all we can do. Okay? Basically everything that we just talked about in that other chart. Okay? Is the pursuit of inherent meaning possible? No. Is the pursuit of created meaning possible? Yes. That is existentialism. Can we solve the problem of meaning? Yes. Create your own meaning. Don't cater to others. Okay? So, basically, this is what we've already discussed. It just sums it up really nicely. Okay? And again, the nihilists, pew, no. All right? So, that's all I really wanted to discuss. I know it was rather lengthy, but I want you to discuss these things when we come back to class after the break so we can finish up Camus. I want to discuss how Marxism plays a part to this. I want to discuss how feminism plays a part to this. And the psychoanalytical side that we were going to do with the id, the ego, and superego, we'll just brush that aside. We'll just talk about it, whatever we see in the book, uh, specifically in part two when we get back. Um, but I just want you to understand these basic concepts so we can have a good discussion um, with regards to Marxism and feminism, which I think you guys will actually enjoy. From this, we'll move on to Ayn Rand. And we'll discuss altruism, which has its own different tenets, and we'll have another lecture on that. Okay? So, I hope you enjoyed this. If not, hey, you get your money back. I don't know what to tell you. But uh, have a great turkey day, and uh, we'll discuss the stranger when you get back.